Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's great to see you and the after effects of COVID are still felt in terms of the audio industry. We missed you guys for a few years and it's great to be back doing these uh, shows and presentations. Uh, Nagra it has a, an extensive history dating back to 1951. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about either history or product technology. Uh, for history, you can look on our website and for technology, also the details you can find on our website. But I would tell you um, that Nagra began uh, with an inventor, innovator, uh, engineer named Stefan Kadelski. Stefan is a, was a Polish uh, gentleman and in 1951 he left uh, Poland, fled basically to Switzerland. As a young engineering student, he made an invention which was a portable magnetic tape recorder. And his idea was to use this in an industry of machining, that is a way of storing instructions on magnetic tape. So he went to machining uh, concerns and tried to sell them on his new, new invention, new product, and they were completely uninterested. So as a 19-year-old, still undaunted uh, and unfazed by that, he thought, what can I do with this machine that I've invented? And at the time, when you uh, wanted to do remote broadcast or remote recording, you had a giant sound truck, washing machine sized pieces of equipment, and an engineer that traveled with you to do that recording on scene or uh, in a remote venue. Stefan realized that I could adapt this machine to do uh, in the field recording. So it was the first portable magnetic recorder that was developed in 1951. The Nagra 1 was a crude machine by today's standards for sure, um, but the Nagra 2 began the, shortly thereafter and was quite a success. Nagra 3 and then Nagra 4 were further advancements. And into the 60s, late, late 60s, 70s, um, virtually every and even into the 80s, virtually every film that was made in Hollywood was recorded, at least the sound, on a Nagra 4 recorder. These recorders are still sought after today. Um, they're highly collectible. If you can find one on the used market, uh, I can tell you that Nagra will still service that. We can refurbish it. But you get in line, like the Morgan cars, the British Morgan cars, the waiting list is that long. It's a couple of years probably to get it refurbished. But once you have it, you have a prized possession. Nagra uh, means in Polish to record. So it does have a meaning to it. And that is our, our history and legacy. Uh, we also have two other divisions. One is a pro division. It's where the, four, where the 4S came from, uh, as well as what I would call, and perhaps uh, it's, it's a misnomer, the spy division. We call it our security division. If you remember the old Mission Impossible television series, where uh, the beginning of the show, there was a recording that was played and they told the, the gentleman, if you choose to accept this assignment, and then they gave him the, the uh, uh, information over the recorder, and that recorder then, the tape would self-destruct and smoke. That's uh, the Nagra uh, SN or the Series Noir, the Black Series, it was a spy uh, device and it was sold to governments, the NSA, the CIA, the British equivalents and the uh, other friendly ally equivalents of intelligence agencies. We continue that legacy today but in a digital format and our products are sold only to governments and government uh, type intelligence agencies. Um, the other division is our high-end division high-end audio, home audio, and that really began around 1995 with a product called the PLP. It also is a legendary uh, preamplifier and still sought after today. Um, collectors and, and those uh, who are in the know still sometimes prefer that over current uh, technologies. It's a tube-based uh, battery-operated preamp. That set off uh, into motion an, a series of amplifiers, and then if you fast forward to today, you'll see the gear that we have now. Uh, I can give you just a quick overview of what we do now. There are three product lines. The classic line, which we say it's our affordable line. We realize that for most it is still aspirational. Uh, but uh, we have the classic line products, the HD line, which uh, up until very recently was our highest level of achievement. 
and we've introduced two products in the new line called the reference line, a turntable and a phono cartridge. But here we've got at least the electronics uh, preamp and uh, DAC and amplifier from our highest line, the HD line uh, products. And what I can tell you is we've got an HD preamp on the top, on the top right hand side. Uh, that's its power supply on the bottom second shelf. It's a massive uh, SuperCat power supply. We believe in power supplies in much the same way that NAME does. It's the power supply that really uh, impacts Sonics, uh, perhaps one of the most in any design. Uh, they're not optional. When you buy an HD product, it's two boxes. Uh, all of the front end electronics are tube based. Uh, below the HD preamplifier is a classic phono. Up until very recently, that was our flagship uh, tube based phono stage. It's supported by an optional classic PSU to its immediate left. And that's also a super cap power supply, but a smaller bank of super caps. Below that is the HD DAC X, which is our ultimate statement in DAC uh, electronics. It also is supported by a uh, super cap power supply, in this case, an even larger power supply than the HD preamp. One of the things that uh, just in general, we need to think about as both as designers and consumers is our signal that emanates either from an instrument or from a voice. I mean, when you think about it, we, we want to harm that original uh, note that comes out or the, the pluck string or whatever as least as possible. But we have to recognize that by the time it comes out of that speaker, we've harmed it a lot. So the best we can do is harm it as least as possible. I mean, when you think about the diaphragm of a microphone moving and translating that uh, acoustical energy, mechanical energy, energy into electrical energy, and then all of the stages that it goes through. Every bit of wire, every bit of circuitry harms that signal. So with Nagra, it's very important to us to have this philosophy, how little can we harm the signal? So a great deal of research and development goes into every product, uh, sometimes years. Uh, the HD phono stage is over three years old. That's going to be coming out uh, the first production run in mid-October, and it'll be in England uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but if you think about it, um, things like vibration control, these towers that you see on all of the HD products, that's not aesthetics. Within that tower, there is uh, a viscoelastic dampener and then a... Um, uh, plastic or uh, seat that it sits in, uh, followed by below that, you see the silver and then the black line, that is a constrained layer damping platform that each of those components stand on. Uh, on the top of those towers, there's a little divot. And if you stack the two units, both the power supply and the, the control unit, um, there's a little ceramic ball that you place in there to further isolate. So vibration control is very important to us. For our classic series, we use those vibration control platforms below the equipment. Circuit design itself is critical in terms of the least harm that we can do to a signal. As our circuit and parts layouts, uh, we spend a lot of time on a computer optimizing those two things. Parts choice is critical as well. Uh, shielding is very important to us also. One highlight that I would like to feature on the preamp itself is uh, a volume control. Volume controls in preamps really do substantial harm to the signal, whether they be potentiometer based or discrete resistor based. The Nagra uh, uh, volume control does not attenuate the signal at all. What it does is uh, it, it's an automatic tap selection of uh, output transformers that are custom wound. It takes hours to wind one of these transformers, and there are two of them, uh, one for each channel in an HD preamplifier. Um, it allows for greater transparency and, of course, less harm of the signal. It is a patent-protected uh, uh, technology. The amplifiers themselves are solid state. Uh, we've chosen MOSFETs as the transistor devices within them. There is a massive bank of capacitors uh, that are vertically arrayed. Uh, the amplifier started out the design brief with four capacitors per uh, amplifier bank. Uh, then we said, well, if four is good, 
what would six do? So we added two more on top of that. The height of the amplifier grew a little bit more. So we said if six is good, what would eight be like? And eight was even better. So the amplifier grew a little bit taller. Uh, we said, okay, eight, 10, and 10 really didn't provide any substantial benefits. So the height is dictated by uh, the layout of the design itself. There is a massive toroidal uh, uh, transformer in there as well. 250 watts per channel into eight ohms. It doubles into four ohms and then doubles again uh, as you go uh, reduced into uh, ohmage. Um, it is a wonderful uh, pair of monoblocks. Um, I was a customer for this gear before I began working for the company. Um, and I, I feel like um, what distinguishes Nagra sound, if you can say that, is that it is a very natural, very relaxed sound. For many, it will be the last piece of equipment or the last piece of equipment that they buy. Uh, you, don't, you sort of get off the merry-go-round and sort of stop chasing your tail. Okay, that's enough about uh, Nagra technology. What I'd like to do is play some selected tracks for you on the turntable, and then if we have time, some, some secret tracks that most people have never heard, except the people who attended those concerts. So let's see if we can do that. Um, the selections that I have for you, I've chosen for, one, um, to give you an idea of what to listen for in equipment, because they're good pieces of, of works to listen to particular things that audiophiles care about. Um, the, the other is to introduce you perhaps to a couple of uh, pieces of classical music. At least in the United States, if I need a break at a show like this, if I put a piece of classical music on, it clears the room out. So I get five minutes to go refresh myself and come back. I found that European audiences are a bit more tolerant, uh, but I brought two pieces for those of you who say, I don't listen to classical music, that maybe it would be a good introduction for you. Uh, the first piece that I'd like to play is um, a track from uh, tenor saxophone legend Gene Ammons. Uh, it's recorded in the 1960s, and I'm a little bit intimidated. Um, the legend Tony Faulkner is here, and I, I'm really uh, nervous about speaking about recording and uh, qualities and whatnot, and I think that I, I probably will make a fool out of myself in front of Mr. Faulkner. But, um, it was recorded in the 1960s uh, during a time when recording uh, techniques were very simple. Microphoning was simple. There were vacuum tube microphones, vacuum tube mic preamps, and so forth. Uh, it also was a time when tricks were played to enhance the perception of stereo. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, when stereo was very first introduced, and then in the early 60s, uh, the families, the fortunate families on the street would go from a mono speaker and a mono amplifier to two speakers and a stereo amplifier. And they wanted to show this off to their neighbors, so there were these demonstration discs that were produced where a train would go from the left side to the right side. And the neighbors would say, do it again, and they'd play this back and forth. But recording engineers for music also played kind of tricks like that. They did at least what we called in the United States pan potting. So a particular instrument would be hard to the left, uh, vocals uh, to the middle, and then perhaps drums to, to the right. It was a very unnatural sound. And I explain this to you uh, to, to indicate to you there's nothing wrong with the system that you're gonna hear. The saxophone will be hard left, it was deliberate, and then piano, and ultimately you'll hear drums at the close, uh, hard right. Uh, this particular piece of music you will find in a film called, a small film called Fading Gigolo. Uh, there's an actor named John Turturro. You may uh, recognize the name. If you don't, you may have recognized the face if you ever saw the film, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I mean, he wasn't uh, George Clooney star type of uh, appearance in that film, but he, he has a quirky face and a quirky mannerisms. Uh, but he's a super smart guy. He wrote the film, he directed it, and he starred in it with Woody Allen. At the time that he was writing this, he listened to this particular album in the background through much of his writing. And he said, I have to find a way to get some of these songs into the soundtrack. So the track that I'll play for you is My Romance, uh, and it appears in that soundtrack. <laughs>
All right, the next track I uh, hope doesn't try your patience. It's classical music. Uh, it's Camille Saint-Saëns. The work is Danse Macabre. And it was inspired by a French poem by the French poet Henri Cazali. Uh, in its, uh, it's the dance of death, the dance macabre. It's introduced by a violin. The violin represents death. And it's, it takes place in a graveyard. The scene is a graveyard. And it's in the middle of night, in the dark, and the violin death calls up the skeletons from their graves. And they dance a dance macabre to this sort of, at some points, furious violin. You will hear what uh, Kazali wrote in the poem uh, as in words, zig a zig a zig. Zig and zig and zig, representing the dance. You'll hear that played musically. And then towards the end of the piece, you'll hear an oboe, a plaintive oboe, uh, and that is, um, represents a, a cock crowing, signaling that the sun's going to come up, and it's time for the skeletons to go back to their grave. So if the, sometimes it's a little bit easier if there's a story that goes along with the piece of music to get into classical music, so I offer it for that reason. Also, it's a, an early 1960s orchestral recording, again, with simple microphoning, vacuum tube products also. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'd like to uh, go to a vocalist, if I could. Um, and I, I brought this record to uh, demonstrate a technology that's coming back in vogue with audiophiles, at least. And that is the one-step process. Are you familiar with that? Does that ring a bell for anybody? There was a big controversy with Mobile Fidelity recently about their uh, marketing campaign for these very expensive limited edition records that they claimed were one step from the original master tape. And in fact, they were, for a lot of them, uh, digital uh, copies that, that they took the, uh, pressed the records from. Uh, this is a true one step. So it's taken from the original tape, uh, the, 33, the 30 IPS quarter inch tape. And the one-step process, if you imagine it as an, you take an original photograph and you photocopy it, that doesn't look as good and you've lost detail resolution compared to the original photograph. And then you put that copy on the copy machine and copy it again. And you lose even more resolution. And then you, maybe you copy it again and it looks nothing like the original photograph. Again, this is sort of harming the signal, another place that the original signal can be harmed. Uh, the one-step process gets it as close as possible for uh, pressing on vinyl back to the, uh, the tape as, as, as possible. It's an expensive process to do. And as Mr. Faulkner said yesterday, if you were here, lacquers can be $500. And y you don't get a sort of an, another, uh, y you can't correct it in the same way that you can with a traditional uh, re record producing process. So it's really expensive for a label to do that because they're never perfect the first lacquer. Um, so it takes a lot of commitment on a record label's part. This is a label called Groove Note. It's a small record label. The artist is uh, Vanessa Fernandez. She's Singaporean and spent a large part of her career as a, a radio announcer. And I won't play the whole track, just a portion of it for you to hear what a one-step sounds like. I used to think that direct cut or direct to disc was the way to go, uh, but I'm now being, and maybe, maybe it's just the recordings that I've been listening to that are one-steps, but I think I prefer that technology if I had to choose one or the other uh, over the direct uh, to disc recordings. Feet open. 
in the cigar Living in a lesson mind If I do take the time Waiting for my heart quiet as it's getting Get so far gone. Do I belong? Where in the world did I ever go wrong? I took the time to replace my mind erased. I still feel as if I'm here, but I'm not. The next track comes from a small, small label called Yarlung Records. Yarlung Records is a Los Angeles-based uh, company. It is basically a one-man operation uh, run by a, a gentleman named Bob Atier. Uh, its sole purpose in existence is to support young artists um, and give them a chance to have their material recorded and released. Uh, it's a U.S. 501c, 501c corporation, so it's, it's a nonprofit organization. This particular track is uh, an interpretation of Miles Davis' classic So What from the biggest selling jazz LP of all time, uh, Kind of Blue. It's Yuko Mabuchi, a Japanese artist's interpretation of that. And it's, uh, it's a piano, a trumpet, a bass, and drums. It's recorded live. Um, and, and if you go on YouTube to the Yarlung Records uh, website, you can see this, uh, how the, the microphones were laid out. And I'm impressed by it because uh, piano and trumpet are two of the hardest instruments to record, and I think they're done very well in this particular case. So a great sense of space and three-dimensionality in this, and also there's a great sense of dynamics and power from particularly the trumpet. I won't play the whole track. It begins with Yuko Momuchi playing the, the main theme from So What? Um, and then it, the trumpet picks up, and then it goes to a drum solo, kind of, and then uh, back to the uh, recapitulation of the main theme. I'll just play through the uh, part of the trumpet uh, section. <laughs> Okay, so we're running out of time, so I want to run through one quick uh, last track on LP. It's about two and a half minutes long. And this is just totally to have fun with. Um, audiophiles and, and us in general in the industry take ourselves a little bit too seriously. This is a 1969 recording. Um, and I would ask you guys uh, if you know the, the genre swamp rock. Have you ever heard of that? Swamp rock is a, an American genre um, that you might have heard popularized by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Uh, and it's from the deep south, the, the notion of swamp rock. But those guys were from California. They never came close to a real swamp. Uh, but they were the ones that were commercially successful. This gentleman grew up in the Louisiana swamp, so he knows what he's singing about, and he experienced that life. Uh, this is Tony Joe White. Uh, the track is called Poke Salad Annie, and it was a hit for Tony Joe White in the late 60s, and then also a hit for Elvis Presley, and Johnny Cash covered it as well. So, not too serious, this, this track. Okay, I have about three minutes left. Um, I'd like to play the secret tracks for you, which are unreleased tracks from the Montreux Jazz Festival. Uh, the Montreux Jazz Festival was started in 1967. Uh, Claude Nobbs, the founder of the festival, wanted everything recorded. So just about every single concert, every single track 
Every single song was recorded. Uh, Nagra has a very special relationship with the Jazz Festival. Uh, we've supported the Jazz Festival almost since its inception, and we continue to do that till today. Uh, and as a result, we have access to the vaults, and I brought along um, some digitally stored uh, recordings from the Jazz Festival. Uh, trying to think what, what to play after Tony Joe White. <laughs> Uh, the recording quality really varies uh, depending on who was working the soundboard that night. If it was the professional company Mayer Sound, which uh, has provided the sound reinforcement for the festival for most of its existence, the recordings are generally pretty good. If a band insisted or an artist insisted on their own engineers, they're usually pretty bad. Um, so I'm, I'm going to play it on one of our professional recorders. I'm going to use it as a digital transport. The music is stored on an SD card. So it's this Nagra 7 anniversary edition that you're seeing, this little box here. Didn't even think twice. Broke two shackles more. 